Good afternoon, morning, or middle of the night, depending on what side of the pod you're on. And welcome to an extra special episode of Across the Pitch. We're the show for people who think Swansea was a ballet by Tchaikovsky. (laughs) (laughs) I was wondering what you were going to do with that intro. (laughs) Yes, we're uh, we're here to talk about uh, uh, Swansea, who... uh, they, they made a good run in the championship, and we were hoping uh, when we scheduled this up that we were going to be previewing a uh, playoff championship game. Didn't quite work out that way, but we're, we're very excited to have somebody that, that we've really wanted to have on the show for a, a long time. I think that uh, he's one of our, uh, our very first listeners, a uh, Phoenix Rising season ticket member, and all around good guy. Uh, welcome to the show, Mark Richards. Welcome, thank you. Buddy. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to finally be on here. You know what? It's been over a year, and I can tell you the exact moment you became a fan of Across the Pitch. And it's somewhat uh, coincidental, I guess you could say, because um, it was the moment when you caught me recording my sounds of uh, Phoenix Rising. That's podcast. correct. Yes, absolutely correct. Probably about almost uh, 18 months ago or so, I'm going to say. I think we became friends at that very point in time. And I went to interview you. This is hilarious. I went to interview you, and I'm recording you. You're saying some great stuff. Phil Kennedy calls in the middle of the freaking interview. (laughs) (laughs) Kills the recording. He didn't know anything about it, of course, but I caught about 20 seconds of what you said, mate. (laughs) Yeah, I I remember that. Incredibly well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember what it was is uh, I, I had seen on Facebook that I think you had posted that you had a flat tire or something. And I, I was calling to see if you needed help with your tire. And you're like, oh, man, I was in the middle of an interview. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, But what we're here to talk about tonight is, uh, well, well, a couple of things, really. Uh, we had, had first talked to Mark when uh, you know, Swansea had uh, gone up uh, 1-0 in the first leg of the, the playoff match against Brentford. Uh, they were looking like they might have a good chance to, uh, to play in the EFL Championship playoff final. Uh, and they worked their way back to the Premier League. We, we were kind of hoping to uh, get to talk about that. Things didn't quite work out the, the way that we had hoped. And uh, it was a bit of a rough afternoon for Swansea. They did make a late push uh, after falling behind 3-0. They got a, a goal there uh, in the, the second half. They had a couple of chances late. Uh, I know there was a shot in stoppage time, probably around the 93rd minute, that just curled outside the crossbar. So, so Mark, uh, you know, tell us what was, uh, you know, from from your uh, eyes and perspective of watching that match. I I know you said it was further than than he kind of expected them to get Mm -hmm. this year. uh, But once they got there, you, you were really hoping that they could push through. So, uh, you know what? What was your perspective on watching that match the other day? It, it must yeah, have been I mean, a roller coaster, man. It must have been a roller coaster. It's always a roller coaster watching the Swans. I mean, even going back just a few years to when we were in the Premier League, we've never done things the easy way. Uh, but after winning the first leg of that playoff uh, at home one nil, I wasn't entirely convinced it was going to be an easy game. Brentford played very attractive football. And I like the way they play. Uh, So when we went to Griffin Park uh, yesterday, I was fearful that they would go go out on the attack. That's exactly what happened. But the way we fell behind and just didn't really honestly look like we'd ever get back into the game. I kind of knew at that point, oh, well, Premier League can wait another year. If If that really ever happens, I mean, I have severe doubts about the future for Swansea and a lot of other league clubs. Uh, but then obviously Ryan Brewster got that goal 
uh, as he's so willing to do in the last couple of games, he just pops up and scores amazing goals for fun. And uh, all of a sudden, the hope was back on. Wasn't to be. You were kind of on a bit of a hiding when it comes down to one of those storylines. I mean, let's face it, Brentford have been pretty good this year. Yeah, they have. As you say, they've played some really, really good football. But here's the ultimate storyline, right? So that was their last game at their old stadium, wasn't it? Yep. Like, you guys were never going to win that. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> it just wasn't going to happen. It, it, it would have been worse if they'd have had their supporters there. But as it was, they were playing for the pride of, you know, saying goodbye to Griffin Park. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was there at uh, the Vetchfield in Swansea back in 2005 when we played our last home game there before we moved into the Liberty. And uh, yeah, nothing was going to stop us from winning. That's probably something that we, we probably should establish for the listeners that, that, that aren't uh, local folks that, that see you out at the uh, the South End with us. So Mark, you live in Phoenix now, but <laughs> uh, but Swansea is your uh, your home team. There is that your, your hometown? You, you come from that area, right? I do, yeah. I, I am a Swansea boy, or Jack as we're known. Uh, quite incredibly, um, I wasn't actually born in Swansea by a complete and utter fluke on my part. I was born a little bit too early. We were living in London at the time. Uh, so I actually got born in London uh, while I should have been born a few hours or a few days later in Swansea. But that's but, where you call home, right? Yeah, Swansea is what I call or where I call home. Uh, it's always been my home team. I'm not a glory chaser. We've been through ups and downs and have been the worst team in the football league for numerous, numerous years of my life. And uh, yeah, win, draw or lose, I'm Swansea till I die. You know, you're involved with the AZ Jacks also, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, I am. Yep. Yeah, who are now part of the uh, stateside Jacks. So it's a larger affiliation. Can you, can you now, I've asked this question to you before. Mark, because I, being an ignorant Aussie, I guess you could say, I hadn't heard the term Jax when it comes to Swansea. I've heard mm-hmm. Swansea, of course, you know, but Jax is a new one for me. What's the deal with that? It's all to do with a legend of a dog, believe it or not. There's a lifeguard station in a place called Mumbles, just like uh, you can't talk, you're mumbling. There's a place <laughs> called Mumbles right. in Swansea, and there's a lifeguard station there, and the legend of the story is that. Uh, Jack, this little uh, dog, I can't remember what breed of dog it was. I think it may have been a Jack Russell even, uh, was on oh, board yeah. one of the yeah, lifeboats. Yeah. That's a Welsh Terrier or something, eh? Yeah, he was on board one of the lifeboats and actually rescued quite a few people one night, so the legend of Jack was born. Was, was Jack fighting dragons? Not at that time. <laughs> oh, you killed them all off by then, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jack, uh, it's lifeboat off of Swansea and uh, no. <laughs> That's pretty cool, actually, I've got to say. That's random, but cool. Yeah. I mean, we, we pride ourselves on being called Jacks, but if you're from the other side of Wales, uh, Cardiff City, they'll call us Jack and then an expletive, <laughs> which I won't use right now. Uh, and it's not a term of... Yeah, it's not a term of endearment. <laughs> so, uh, how uh, how how big is the uh, the Swansea following here stateside? I know you said that the AZ Jacks are, are part of a uh, a larger uh, group. Is uh, is Swansea pretty well represented over on this side of the pond? We are. We now have representation in almost every state here in the states. It's such a large thing that, funny enough, at yesterday's game against Brentford in the changing room. Um, we actually had a stateside Jack's banner up in the changing room. I saw that. That is amazing. And also, if you order you know, one of their kits or get one of their replica kits sent over, they will ask, do you want a English Premier League or a English Championship badge on the arm, or do you want a stateside Jack's badge? They actually have a special patch for the arms. Ooh, I think we need to get something like that for, for Akron today, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the Accrington fans and uh, you guys included over here. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you could get something like that going, it, it would be tremendous. So now you have a flag uh, that the, you, you hang out at the uh, the Phoenix Rising, a uh, uh, Jack's Jack, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> It's a curious thing about that, and I, I want to go back to something that you said earlier. 
Mark. Mm-hmm. And that was uh, your friends up the road, or as you could say, up the road. <laughs> um, so, all right, all right. Let, let's go into that, Phil. I'm coming back to your question in one second, okay? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, but um, your friends up the road, and I put friends in inverted commas because I was <laughs> a podcast and you can't see me doing that. <laughs> uh, Cardiff, Cardiff City. Mm-hmm. Not much love lost there. They lost today. Did that make you feel a bit better? It, I'll be honest, it <laughs> did make me feel a hell of a lot better today. All credit to them. They put on a better performance against Fulham today than we did against Bradford. Cardiff should have been dead and buried being 2-0 down. They put on one hell of a fight. And if they had made the final, I wouldn't have supported them. I would have had a little part of me inside me that says, yes, you're a Welsh team. So there's a little part of me that says, good luck. But no, I couldn't I couldn't have supported them. <laughs> that, that would have been that five minutes for you to be in. Oh, yeah, I was born in London. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if if you to go by where I was born, then the team I should support would be West Ham United, because technically, where I was born, I'm a Cockney. That's so, true. so make of that what you will. <laughs> that sounds like a Cockney to me, mate. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I I know what that is now too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so going back to what I was uh, yeah. saying earlier, is you. Uh, You've got a flag that uh, that you bring out uh, to the Phoenix Rising games uh, uh, where, where you represent Swansea out there. And uh, tell us a little bit about how that got started. That flag is actually from the stateside jacks. As of last season, me, my wife, and my daughter stand in the supporters' end at Phoenix Rising is quite ironically typically right behind the Cardiff City flag. Um, <laughs> well, that's where I was going to go with this. Okay, carry on, Mark. Yeah, um, it, it's just because the uh, other members of the Arizona Jacks, they don't come to games as often as they used to anymore. So uh, until I can get hold of the flag from them and bring it along every single game um, or get, get another one made, um, yeah, I, I can only represent the Jacks with their flag if uh, they come along. Other than that, I rather reluctantly stand oh, wow. behind that Bluebirds uh, <laughs> banner and, uh, yeah, just, just support Phoenix Rising and not bring the <laughs> clubs into it. No, I think that's great that we have people from all over the world. I'll, I'll bring my Sydney FC flag in, which I don't have. But there you go. One that I saw was, um, it was like a half and half flag. What the hell was up with that, go? A half and a half flag. It, it had, oh, yeah, I um, think I saw a flag that had the, the swan the and the bluebird on it, I think. Exactly, yeah. Who's is I, that? I've never seen that one. I mean, if if there's somebody going around with that, then they're very conflicted people. <laughs> 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 there, there was one that was put up at the very first and therefore only home game we've had this year, uh, which was actually created by my daughter. Um, which was two Phoenix Rising supporters uh, drawn in an anime kind of style, because that's what she's into, uh, with a Wales supporter in the middle. So we had a white shirt Phoenix Rising uh, supporter, uh, one of the black shirt Rising supporters, and then a Wales supporter in the middle. Uh, but it was all uh, up and uh, it was fairly large and prominent banner at the first and only game so far this year. So now, uh, one thing I wanted to, to actually talk to you about here, and this is something that, that me and you have talked about a, a bit at the games, is uh, is since you've come to the States, uh, you've uh, grown to uh, to start following some American sports as well, haven't you? I certainly have. It's taken me a long time to find something that has the same energy as football back home. Uh, and that's why it took me so long to find Phoenix Rising because I've been through just about every sport out here trying to find the same kind of passion. I mean, I've gone and seen uh, the Cardinals numerous times, the Coyotes numerous times, gone and seen uh, the Diamondbacks, which I really don't know why because I cannot stand baseball. Um, <laughs> re- recently, but m- more recently, and I know me and Aaron, we talked about very briefly about this one of the first times we met. We also got heavily into uh, the Arizona Rattlers, the indoor mm-hmm. football team. No, you would have been talking to Phil about that. Yeah, that, uh, oh, sorry, that's... Yeah, Phil. <laughs> no and, problem. Uh, that's actually yeah. where I, I, I... I'm glad you brought that up because that's exactly where I was going with it is... Uh, 
And so uh, you and myself are, are both uh, season ticket holders for both the uh, the Rattlers and the Phoenix Rising. And uh, unfortunately, some of the uh, the games end up falling on the same days, so mm-hmm. it uh, it makes it kind of hard. But uh, that was one thing that, that we had talked about is that that if the uh, the indoor arena football, uh, it really does. Uh, you know, you, you get some of the most passionate fans in there, and it is, uh, to me, other than uh, the, when we used to have minor league hockey, uh, the, the indoor arena football is probably the closest atmosphere to association football or, or soccer and, and with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you. The Rattlers uh, certainly have a very or uh, had at the time a very noisy and a very passionate fan base very small group but it, the passion and the intensity was there and I think that's what really drew me and my wife to them um, other than that there was a indoor pre- premier lacrosse team here in Arizona oh yeah um, I that. yeah the Arizona Sting mm-hmm. and I was a season ticket holder for them and they made the Super Bowl uh, which amazingly had to be held here in Glendale. And uh, then the team went back bankrupt when the league went on strike the following year. But they also had a great following and a uh, great passionate fan base, but nothing quite as loud or as uh, extreme as the uh, Phoenix Rising fans right now. They're, they're on a different level. Oh, yeah, that's that's a whole uh, whole new experience. I mean, what you... Uh, and the Phoenix Rising, I think it's important to... To kind of point out that, that they're a, a relatively new thing here. It was, what, about five years ago that they started out in Peoria, and then uh, three years ago that they moved to, to their current stadium? Mm-hmm. Well, yep. they, they, they've been going along for as uh, uh, Arizona soccer. Arizona right. United, and then the Wolves yeah. before that. Yeah, the Wolves. Uh, so they've, they've had a little bit of history here, but it's really only they, they kicked in the top gear when they did the rebrand and moved down to well, Tempe Scottsdale region there. Cedar uh, um, Arizona Field. Right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know where they play, funny enough. Mark, um, so onto that, onto that, onto that. Phoenix Rising, you're obviously a fan of Phoenix Rising. I've, I've seen you there season after season. It seems like in this truncated COVID-affected season that um, we're kind of going through the same mistakes as what we did in previous seasons. And I know you've had a plenty to say to me about this before. Um, do you think we have enough time to turn it around is what I'm going to ask you right now. Honestly, I was thinking of this very same thing uh, just the other night when we were losing to Orange County. I was like, we've been here before, uh, but this time is a couple of factors, COVID included and this truncated season, that I think are going to work against us. We've now got a much deeper squad. I think. Chance is kind of at a loss right now as to who to pick for a starting 11 11, because he's changing his lineup week in, week out, and we've got no continuity like we did at the beginning of last season and the season before. But this year, it's going to cost us because of this COVID season. Yeah. It seems like he is trying to maybe get the best players on the field. Like, Like he's trying to get his 10 most talented guys out as opposed to getting the guys that fit the positions. I, I think that I, I wasn't a big fan of moving Flemings back to the midfield. Are you guys kind of seeing that same thing? Yeah, that was a terrible move. Yeah. I mean, he, he didn't take into account, you know, we played Orange County the first time and yeah, he's going to blame the pitch as every manager would, but then he didn't take that into account in the second game. We knew it was going to be the same conditions, but he did nothing about it. He didn't change the lineup to take into account those kind of conditions either. You know, rather than playing nice attacking on the ground football that we're used to, rather than playing that style, which is what he went ahead and did, he should have, you know, been playing something long ball or down the wing, you know, so we can bypass all of the crap that was in the middle of the field. It seems very clear, and I was I was on the uh, the conference call that he did with the media yesterday, uh, and it seems that, that Shantz is very clear in stating that his tactics and their way of playing 
is their way of playing and they're kind of not going to adjust that from game to game. And he says, you know, we won 20 games in a row last year without adjusting our tactics. Hang on. Uh, what that- works, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I don't know if I completely agree, but he is very straightforward in saying, this is our tactics and this is how we're going to play and we're not going to change that. You know, we said this on the pod last week, mate. It's become very, very obvious what sort of game we play. And a team like Orange County play a physical game and they out-physical this again. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's, that's not a coach that's adapting to the situation. This is a coach that's sort of saying, no, our tactics, our, our style of play will bring us through. And it didn't for the second week in a row. Mark, you had some sharp words when I spoke to you last season, the beginning of last season, uh-huh. Rick Shantz. Um, Sure, the players aren't clicking right now. Um, there's some new blood in the squad. Cool, no worries. But it, it still seems like, no, you're, you're going to fit the system rather than you're going to fit the opposition. What do you say to that? Yeah, um, I think this year or this season, it's even worse than it was last season. Like I said, we've got a much larger squad of much more talented players in pretty much every position this season. And I think with the news that we heard this week with Peter Ramage going back home, it's really going to affect our team. I think Ramage was kind of a backbone behind a lot of stuff. And I don't think Chance is going to be able to overcome his loss either. And I think we're going to become probably the also rans of the league this year, to be honest. I, I think we're going to be top four. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't think that uh, we're, we're set to become the also rans of the league per se. I think that, that we have too much talent, but I, I do think that you bring a massive point forward in terms of uh, the loss of Peter Ramage. That, that's huge. I mean, I, I think that, you know, a lot of times it's kind of not understood how much uh, an assistant coach might have to do with the day-to-day tactics. But I think that, that Peter Ramage was a guy who was very, very involved with the, the day-to-day workings of the players. And that's not just a guy that you can get replaced on the fly that's going to be able to walk in and have chemistry with the players. Uh, he's no. built rapport with them for two years. No, you're right, Phil. And, you know, Peter Ramage, he's gone up to Newcastle United under 23. So basically he's Premier League level coach mm-hmm. right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that is a level of coach that, get, bless him, good on him. Well done, mate, for, for moving up. I'm proud of you. And thank you for your time here at Phoenix Rising. But... <laughs> Yeah, you're right, Phil. We're going to have a hard time filling this guy. And I just wonder whether, and you know what, I, I hesitate to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, whether he's papering over the cracks of the chance of rain. Oh. Well, I, I mean, I don't know if, if that's necessarily what it is. I, I think it's one of those things where they were a good team that worked together. I mean, we, we talk about Accrington Stanley so much and, and you know, John Coleman and, and Jimmy Bell or you know, they're they're referred to as John and Jimmy almost like they're one at the same. I uh, and you know, so so imagine Accrington Stanley if Jimmy Bell law left uh, you know, John Coleman would have a huge, huge hole to fill. And it's really very similar where you know you have your coach losing his right hand man. I, I mean it's uh, you know, uh, uh, Andy Griffith losing Barty Fife out of Mayberry, you know. <laughs> I, I hear what you're saying, Phil, but here's here's my question. No, actually, it's not a question. It's a statement, and it is this: Who do they bring in? That's a question. And the quality of coach that they bring in, the assistant coach that they bring in, will send either alarm bells or I don't know, vuvuzelas, depending on which way you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's clear you know, if it's someone that's sort of worked their way up through the ranks, you got to sort of think that maybe there's some sort of issue here at Phoenix Rising. 
Do you know what I mean? Blair, Blair Gavin is still there, so I, I imagine that Gavin would probably just kind of step forward into uh, Ramage's role, and then they would hire somebody to to fill uh, uh, Gavin's role. But I mean, the, the way I look at it, and, and this is the way that, that Rick Schultz, uh, you know, put it on the, the coach's call yesterday when he was talking about it, is Rick Schultz said, look, we have a guy that's leaving our club to go and join a Premier League team. Uh, this is something that's almost as good for Phoenix Rising CV as it is for Peter Ramage's CV, if you will, because, you know, this is a club that has a guy that's now moving on to what would be considered a promotion. So that makes it a, a job that other people are, are going to, to want to have because they'll say, okay, you know, Peter Ramage was here. Now he's with Newcastle. If I go to Phoenix, you know, maybe my next job will be somewhere in the Premier League. I'll give you that, Phil. Yes, that that is solid. But what I'm saying is that the next appointment is going to talk volumes about the ambitions of the ownership. Mark, did you I agree. That? Yeah, mm. uh, I, oh, I absolutely yeah. agree. I mean, you could promote Blair Gavin. I mean, I think he's already the assistant coach anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but then who do you bring in to replace him or, you know, to in case Chance or Gavin leaves or whatever happens? I don't honestly see anybody in the current setup or even Tucson's setup who could immediately fill that role and give us the expectation that we want to move forward football-wise. You'd have to look at somebody who's either got, heaven forbid, MLS experience or experience of a you know Premier League elsewhere in the world. And uh, I don't realistically see anybody wanting to take a USL job right now. Well, I mean, Ramage and Gavin both were, were guys that played for Phoenix Rising and kind of retired into the position. So, I mean, historically speaking, Phoenix Rising hasn't gone out and, and hired experienced coaches into that position. Uh, I, I would say I, I don't necessarily know if there's a, a veteran player on the roster right now that would fit that role, but I. I, I kind of see them going in that same direction again of finding a, a player that's, you know, 35 years old at the tail end of his career and, you know, uh, kind of... I've, I've got two things to say that, Phil. So, you're right, we're, we're a club on the rise. Uh, that, that was fun, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but remember, Patrice Carteron went off to a Turkish club and he was bound to fail over the Turkish club, and, and he, he did. He got sacked, and we got Rick Shantz in. So it seems like, hey, I'm, I'm just on that very little limited bit of, of knowledge about the the astute uh, front office there, um, they're probably going to be recruiting from within. Not bad, okay, all right, that's fine. But here's my counterpoint to that: if you have a look at the most um, professional side in the Eastern Conference, and I'm talking about uh, Lou City, Louisville, a uh, mm-hmm. brand new stadium, mm-hmm. spanking stadium, I've been there, it's an impressive piece of work. They went and bought Jason Johnson. Now, are you telling me that they're looking at us going, oi, what are you guys doing over there? Why are you letting this guy go? Where, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that I think there are two teams in the East and the West that should probably vie for rivalry, and we have, but um, they're in the ascendancy. And they're in the, in the, they're in the ascendancy because they're probably a little bit more together, a little bit more well-run. On <laughs> yeah, I mean, more, more money, more... Uh, I, I mean, I, I think the, the one thing to me that, that separates it, and this is something that I don't think it's talked about enough, is that the Phoenix market is super unique. I, I think at one point uh, I put it out on Twitter and we pretty much did establish that Phoenix is the largest city in the world that's never, ever had a first-tier team in uh, in the sport. I mean, the, Phoenix, the Maricopa County, 
has a larger population than the entire country of Uruguay, and they've won a couple of World <laughs> Cups. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it's a massive market to have the USL as the, the number one game in town. Any other market this size has an MLS team. Yeah, but Louisville, I mean, they've, they've got competitors right next door. Do you know what I mean? Right next door. I could have gone to Cincinnati, although they're in the MLS now, but, or Indianapolis or somewhere like that. Do you know what I mean? But Yeah, but people don't strong. tend to have allegiances across state lines. Well, regardless, the, the point being is that, you know, they're able to pull off a very successful franchise there. And I don't see us... Oh, God, I seriously hate to say this, but I don't see us being as serious as they are. These guys are legit. They've built an MLS stadium, these guys. Where's ours? I, yeah, I've, I've got to agree with you again. Thanks, I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, I mean, we're, I we're, we're clearly the number years. one team in the West, and yet we don't seem to be going forward. Right. I think they're a couple of years further into the process than, than we are. I mean, that... That's one thing that we have to look at. I mean, the, the rebrand, it, we're really only three years into the whole rebrand. Or actually, I guess this is the fourth year since the rebrand, fourth year since the new ownership took over. I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, some of these other teams have maybe a, a two-year head start on, uh, you know, like, like Louisville or, or even kind of in Orange County. Uh, where where they had the same branding, same ownership uh, in place for six years as opposed to four years. All right. Well, uh, all right. Let's 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 not get off track here because I feel like we're talking about future when we're talking about when we should be talking about now. Yes, I do wish the most for my Phoenix Rising team, and that makes me the most wonderful, passionate, patriotic fan of Phoenix Rising because of it. Also, a little bit cynical, but that's okay. But <laughs> Let's go. Let's have a look forward to, uh, well, I guess Saturday's match. Uh, we're playing against uh, El Paso. Let's, let's El, El Paso. <laughs> going off the rails, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> the locomotives. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, there was a train that was derailed on a bridge. Hopefully, hopefully that's a signal for El Paso. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> it, you, you mean this has just gone up in flames? <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about that game and uh, I, I mean I, I think that it goes without saying that this is a must win game without a doubt well it's not really a must win game though because it's on that group you know what I'm saying well I, I mean not not mathematically but w- what I'm saying is so if they if they lose this game that's going to be three losses in a row in a 16 game season I, I mean you know, that's four games is 25% of a season. I mean, you can't really afford. I, I mean, like going back to what I was talking about last week with Matt about how this is the same length as an NFL season. How often do you see an NFL team have a three game losing streak and still make the playoffs? I think you need to insert some crickets there. <laughs> um, here, here's the thing though here's the thing right so Los Dos as you made me pronounce them I still think it sounds rubbish Los Dos have had 11 players come down with COVID so they've had to delay their games mm-hmm. it, it would be amazing if we see the season out honestly if we yeah. could get uh, a win or a draw we're back on track so to speak God I, God, I sound like an insensitive bastard when I say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think that the season is going to get canceled. I, I think that people here, you know, they did 11 players on loose dues, and, and it sounds like a huge number. But going back, remember, Phoenix Rising had eight players that had tested positive before we even started playing. Uh, it took them about two weeks. They passed protocol. I mean, this is a, a thing where, you know, most of these guys are, you know, healthy, young, professional athletes that, that are going to recover from this thing quickly. You're right, Phil, but that's 
entirely the point is that, yes, they will recover and probably a bunch of them didn't even realise they had it, so they could have played the game. And all of a sudden, before too long, it's spread across, you know, the, the, the conference. And it's worrying. I'm glad that they cancelled their game against San Diego. That'll be oh, yeah, sure. you know, not a problem. Um, but it's going to be basically back to my question. I'm going to answer my own question, right? Because none of you guys did. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a question. <laughs> there was a question, a statement in there. All right. Uh, yes, it is a. It's it's a win we need to have. Let's just go that way. So take the wins when we can have them. If uh, the season gets shunted forward, fine. That'll be credited towards us. So yes, we need to win against El Paso, and we will. I'm yep. positive about this. Yeah, we do need to win against El Paso. I mean, what, we're a game and three points behind San Diego in Group B. If we don't win, then we really are falling into the clutches of uh, Orange County. Uh, I'm sorry, the Las Vegas lights don't have a hope in hell, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a must win and it's a we will win this one. Yeah, I think that it's the type of game that Phoenix Rising uh, normally do win. Uh, I mean, what what you're looking at is, is El Paso. They're a team that they've had trouble scoring goals over the past two seasons. Uh, they're n- not the kind of team that has the talent on the level of an Orange County that's going to be able to uh, hold Phoenix's offense down. This certainly uh, isn't going to be a situation where we see Phoenix Rising only get one shot on goal. The, the other thing that, that I'm looking at is Phoenix is going to be back at home uh, on their pitch, so they're not going to have to deal with the uh, the bad pitch in, uh, in Orange County anymore. The one thing I would say would be kind of a bit of concern uh, is that this is what we were talking about last week, is that, that Phoenix Rising seems to do better against the MLS2 teams because those teams tend to play more of an attacking style because they seem to be more concerned with player development than than necessarily game planning for the next team. El Paso is another independent team, uh, so they're they're the type of club uh, where they're going to come in with whatever tactics it's going to take to win the game. They're not worried about developing players for a parent club. Well, without using the obvious pun of, you know, let's try and uh, derail their style of play. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I had to get in there before you did. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you've not, you've hit the nail on the head. You know, we're at home. It's going to suit us more than it's going to suit them. They're not scoring goals. They don't have a very uh, strong squad, especially depth-wise as well. I'm looking at their squad right now, and it's paper thin. Also, don't forget, it's going to be hot as it, it, hot yeah. as the devil's lair on Saturday. It's going to be like uh, yeah, I mean, so far they've scored four goals and allowed four goals this year. So they they're basically not real good on offense or defense. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I think the heat is going to really become a factor. I honestly don't think our players are playing in this heat either right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is. Uh, this is the part of the summer where, I mean, today it was, uh, what was it, 42 degrees Celsius today? Uh, 43, if you want to be exact, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> 118 Fahrenheit at the airport. Yeah, so I mean, by, by 7 o'clock kickoff tomorrow, uh, it'd probably still be 105, 107 degrees out. Yeah, it's it's nasty. It's nasty weather. I'll bank money that I'll probably push it back like half an hour at the start of the game just just for the pure comfort of the players. This is actually a good uh, a good time to mention that. So like you said earlier, uh, you first met Mark when you were recording your first ever Sounds of the Game. Uh, we have uh, spoken with uh, the, the Phoenix Rising Media folks. They got to prove to... Uh, to come down and uh, actually uh, tape the the sounds of the game 
without fans of the stadium. So you're going to have part two of that series. Uh, yeah. I'm so, gonna... so Aaron, tell us what you're planning with that. Cause I, I want to hear, I'm, I'm sure you got some interesting ideas for uh, sounds of new fans at the stands. I think it's going to be um, sounds of Phoenix rising in the time of COVID. I think that's, that's the title I was settled on. Um, and, and the idea is pretty much exactly the same thing as what I did before. So walking through the parking lot, um, hearing the planes or well, plane go overhead, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's not many planes up in the skies these days. Um, and walking into the stadium, there being no food trucks. Um, there'll probably be a bit of practice on the field, I'd assume. I'll probably get some uh, some of the sprinklers as they go and sprinkle the, 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 the pitch down, you know. Ch -ch 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 -ch. And what I'm really wanting to grasp, and I hope Phoenix really does come through for me and they score a couple of goals, is that, um, you know, uh, you'll hear the guys cheering on the pitch yeah. with no crowd behind them. But I also kind of want to get some, um, and, and I don't know if you can help me out with this, Phil, but um, maybe some of that Zoom call recording quality so you can... Yeah, well, I'm, I'm bringing out uh, my, uh, my my high quality HD camera, and uh, also I'm planning to interview my own cardboard cutout. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's going to be one of the best interviews ever, mate. <laughs> he, he, he's a lot quieter than I am, though. <laughs> <laughs> if when he answers you back then it's time to worry <laughs> he's got a smaller beer tap too so <laughs> let's uh let's give a uh a score prediction for uh for saturday uh here what, what do you guys uh, have mark since you're the guest uh you give your score prediction first <laughs> Um, three nil to the rising, and I think even though he's been very poor so far, if he starts, Dadashoff will get the hat trick. Oh wow, nice goal! I like that. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna let you know, uh, there's some midfield issues in feeding the ball to Dadashoff, which I think needs to be resolved. I don't want to like antagonise my guest here. But um, I would say Dadashov hasn't been poor. His service has been poor. Would you not agree? No, I, I don't. I didn't think highly of him during preseason. Obviously, yeah. that, obviously that opening game, he got the hat trick and he looked like it was a useful addition to the squad. And since then, I really have thought, yeah, this is exactly what I thought of him in preseason. He's... I don't think he provides anything different to what Adam John did last season, and I think we could have done better. And he was he was an Adam John replacement, though. So, for my yeah, but I don't think he's making himself as useful around the field as Adam did. All right? Yeah. Okay. Well, what I would say is that I think four games into the season last year. We were kind of saying the same thing about Adam John. I mean, I remember he, oh, he started dude. off where he had uh, a goal and an own goal in San Antonio in the opener, and then he didn't do anything for a couple of games, and then, then he really caught fire. So, I, you know, I mean, we're, we're still, at the end of the day, only four games into it, and you know, it, we've kept a lot of the core, but there are new players. Dadashov's new, King is new, Concho is new, and he's been suspended. Hi. Moar is new, Barmby just finally got on. I, I mean, we. It, I, I think it's just too early to to judge any of these guys yet. Uh, I will say, though, Danielle King, I thought was pretty impressive on the right. Oh, yeah, he looks yeah. Like Best sighting we made. He he's a versatile guy too. I mean, he seems like uh, I know that that Schultz was saying in the coaches call that he's a guy that can uh, slide over and play the center mid. He's not just only a fullback. All right. So, Mark, you said uh, three nil. Three nil. Yep. And Dadashov is scoring how many? He's he's getting all three. He's getting the hat trick. Ooh, wow! Impressive. All right. All right. I'm an. I'm a very pessimistic fan, so I'm going to go 2-0. I'm 
I, I guess they're going to be like nervy goals. This is this is how I'm seeing it, right? So we're going to be shaky at the back. There's going to be plenty of shots from a relatively poor El Paso team. Uh, we're still going to look shaky at the back, but we're going to get some late goals, probably coming in the 60th minute and 85th minute. And one of them is going to be Dadashov, and the other one is going to be Asante. And that's going to kick our season on, kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm, I'm going to go 4-1. Uh, I'm going to say that, uh, that we do concede a goal. To me, the, the back line is still lacking some continuity, and I, I think that at some point in the match, uh, will probably be some kind of a uh, mental lapse uh, that might lead to a goal. It just seems like that's kind of been happening in every game so far. But I think the offense will get back on track, like Mark said, back on the home turf, back playing their style of play. Two motherfuckers! I'm going to say uh, Junior Flemings moves back into his regular role uh, and the at the wing, and I'm going to say we're going to see Junior Fleming's involved in all four goals with two goals and two assists from Junior Fleming's at the 4-1 win. All right. Sounds like it's going to be a win for the Rising. Yep. I, I think that, uh, that, that we need to see that, and it's been tremendous fun, guys, but before we wrap up, uh, did you guys have anything else that uh, that we hadn't talked about so far tonight? Yes, I do have one more question for you, Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, looking forward to the Swan season next year. You, you mentioned something to me in, in the messenger last week, or during the week, I should say, um, about you weren't quite ready for Premier League. Mm -hmm. uh, that you were quite okay hanging around. You had a couple of sharp players, a couple of sharp youngsters. You were quite happy hanging around in the championship building up for next year. Tell me a little bit more about that, if you wouldn't mind, because that's curious. Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, spending seven years in the Premier League, most clubs would think that's a great thing. But you don't realise, or a lot of people certainly don't realise over here in the States, that once you come down, you get basically a season or two of what's called a parachute mm -hmm. payment, and that's it. So if you're used to living on Premier League wages, and getting Premier League um, television money, that dries up incredibly quickly. So you can't pay those quality players anymore. Um, as Swansea have shown, they've got rid of every single Premier League star uh, in, in the last season. We have one player left uh, from our Premier League run. We're probably offloading him in the next week or two just because we can't afford it any longer. And with COVID now severely crippling clubs in the UK, there's going to be a lot of clubs, unfortunately, that don't make it to the next season. So as far as Swansea goes, if we'd have gone up, yeah, it's a great thing to go up. But, you know, those promised riches of the Premier League, you don't get them immediately. So we wouldn't have been able to invest in any players. Any players that we do get would have been a false economy. Because we'd come straight back down, we wouldn't have been prepared for it. I think we need a year to rebuild, maybe get rid of our current ownership because they have taken money out and not put a single penny back into the club and get somebody who will actually invest in getting us back into the Premier League properly. That's, that's just something that I had talked about uh, with Tony uh, in, a, in an episode that we recorded earlier today that hasn't been out yet. Uh, is that with Burnley, uh, when they made it up to the Premier League the first time, they went right back down. Uh, and then they were in the championship for three years before they made it back up. Uh, and then they've been up ever since. But during those three seasons, they really spent that time diligently building a team that not just was built of players that were good players at the championship level, but bringing in those pieces that were guys that they knew were going to be able to help them stay up once they got to the Premier League. And to me, that seems, sounds like what you're saying is that Swansea, they didn't have the horses that were going to help them stay up. So they're almost better off taking a year or two at really building that foundation that's going to allow them to, to compete at the next level long term. Yeah, completely. I mean, if you look at the squad that's literally just finished the season yesterday, Half of them are loan players. Half of them are products of our youth academy. 
I think the average age of our squad this year was 22. There isn't enough experience there to last, you know, two games in the Premier League, no matter about the whole season. So upset that we don't get promoted, but at the same time, I'm relieved because it would have been embarrassing to have gone up and come straight back down again. We don't want to be known as Cardiff City who get promoted and then come straight back down. <laughs> or Norwich <laughs> or uh, West <laughs> Brom or any of those. No, well, I, I, lads, you mentioned like the yo-yo teams, but there's been one very successful yo-yo teams of season seasons past, and that's Leicester City. I remember watching the game in you know, 2003, 2004, 2005, and Leicester would continually go up, go down, go up, go down. Is that? Uh, well, I think that had a lot to do with the uh, the, the the gentleman who who now is is deceased in the, the helicopter crash where when he purchased the team, that was really what turned them around. You're right, but that, that was smart accounting, smart business there. And yes, the Leicester fans rightly mourn. I can't pronounce his name. Yeah, I didn't even try with the name. <laughs> it's got more letters to the alphabet. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I kind of saw Swansea doing a similar thing. And I don't know if that's... I mean, you can't call it a lost opportunity. I mean, what you're saying to me, Mark, is that, yeah, we would have gone up and we would have gone back down again, but you had a bunch of youth that were, like, chomping at the bit. You know, they were being bled. They were, like, uh, going to find their teeth. Oh, God, I've run out of analogies uh, in the Premier League. And that's got to be great for the Swansea Academy. It's got to be great for the town as well, right? It, it, it's great for the town. It's great for well, the city. Uh, it's great for the academy. We have a way in Swansea, and it's called the Swansea Way. We would not survive. We know we wouldn't survive. Um, it was a few years ago before Bob Bradley came in to manage us. Oh, oh, I'm, sh- I'm shuddering just thinking of those days. Um, it was a mistake. Yeah. But yeah. We would, 73 of them, was it? But we, <laughs> we, yeah, but we, we were nicknamed Swans Alona because of the way we play football. And that's the way we like it played. And we wouldn't be able to do that with a load of academy players, essentially. As much as, you know, it would be great to watch. They would get hammered week in, week out. And that's not what the fan base of Swansea wants. We want to go up. We want to go up playing proper, decent football, and we want to stay up. We don't want to go up just to say we're Premier League and it comes straight back. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely understand that uh, as a fan, it's probably uh, a lot more enjoyable to watch a season where your team finishes fifth in the championship than watch a season where they finish 20th in the Premier League. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't care if we finish close to the bottom of the Premier League. I just don't want us to be perennial Premier League strugglers or that, you know, yo-yo team up and down every year. It's it's not fun, it's not entertaining, and it takes years off your life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, every, uh, every relegation is a new kind of pain, I have to imagine. So, all right, you don't want to be Norwich, but if you were promoted to the Premier League, who would you rather be? Would you rather be Leeds? Would you rather be Wolves? Or would you rather be West Brom? I would rather be Wolves. Leeds Leeds are living in the past. Yeah, they, they used to be, you know, a big club in the 70s, 60s and 70s, uh, even early 80s. One of my, funny enough, one of my fondest memories in the 80s is before the days of the Premier League when Britain had four divisions, Swansea were in then what would be called the Premier League now. And our opening game of that season in 1981, we beat Leeds United 5-1 at home. And it was just truly tremendous. Nobody ever gave us a chance. We finished sixth that year in our inaugural season in what would be the Premier League. Um, Yeah, the following season, we went straight back down. But we proved that we could hang with the big boys once. It crippled the club, honestly, financially. I don't have a lot of love for Leeds. I think they'll do well in the Premier League this year. Wolves, again, a big club in the olden days, and it's taken them a long time to get back to where they should be. And I admire the way they're doing things. They're not spending lots of money, and they're playing decent football week in, week out. You're like a canny manager. Like, he's yep. a manager. Yeah, I think it's spot, spot on everything you just said right there. Yeah, you're, you're 100% spot on. So... All right. One last question for you, Mark. 
<laughs> yeah, it's been a tremendous amount of fun, Mark. I just want to appreciate it, 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 it has been hey, how you. much we appreciate. <laughs> All right, here's the last question. Who would you rather see go up in the West London Derby, the championship final, Brentford or Fulham? <laughs> uh, this, is, this is a loaded question because I know um, it is I know uh, it <laughs> I've, I've come on you're London born you love both of these teams uh, no I don't <laughs> um, I've, I've already said I admired Brentford's style of football they've been brilliant all season they play the they play the game properly beautiful passing I think they've got an organised setup. the only thing that is going against them is their horrible, horrible yeah. example of a manager. He's awful, uh, isn't he? Just a, always a prick of a thing. Oh. Yes. Well, I, I was the first to uh, have a go at Santi Moore last weekend for what he did at Orange County. But when Brentford's manager basically did the same thing same yeah, to Connor Roberts yesterday, I shouted some incredibly vulgar expletives at the TV and I don't regret a single word of them and because of that it's Fulham all the way not just because they beat Cardiff but Fulham all the way please <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, I saw the Brentford coach doing the same thing I'm like oh god I can't support this team <laughs> that's what the Orange County coach did to us last weekend and that was it was shit play yeah well, at least the Brentford coach got a yellow card for it, whereas I think, oh, my, oh no. No, he didn't. He didn't get a yellow card? He didn't get carded at all. Oh, damn. It was the same thing. And I was, yeah. fu- I was furious. Even though I was going for Brentford. Sorry, mate. <laughs> 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 yeah, I thought that was me a little. Yeah, this has been a tremendous amount of fun. And, and Mark, uh, it has taken way too long for us. For us to get you on the show, we we need to make this a uh, a regular thing, and uh, we look forward to being able to all get together in the the south end and you know shout at the referees and all I, that good stuff that we do with the uh, the Phoenix Rising soon. Uh, you know what, but until you know what, then, what, what we're going to do? What's that? What's that, Aaron? What we're going to do, Phil, is I'm going to recreate um, the interview I did with Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you just keep all the air in your tires this time <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully you won't call him up this time <laughs> yeah <laughs> all i will always try to do is be a good friend and you know it just, right, just backfired right. on me <laughs> <laughs> it's all good mate so but I, I did. Uh, I, I was so uh, so excited to introduce Mark that I did forget to say at the beginning of the show that my name is Phil Kennedy, and I'm here with my brother from down under, Aaron Air. So I will say that uh, as we uh, uh, exit the uh, the show tonight. Uh, and, and did you guys, uh, either one of you, have anything else before we uh, we sign off? Not this time. All I'm going to say is good luck, Phoenix Rising. Uh, I was like- Yep, up go rising. rising. Up, up the rising. Rise.